Hey everyone, welcome back to the Infatuation Podcast. Today we're talking to Chef Ming Tsai. Yeah, you know him from East Meets West, or maybe simply Ming. He's been doing it uh, like at least 20, 25 years, right? He's, you've, I know you've seen him on TV. He's now on Iron Chef as well on Netflix. And he really couldn't have been nicer. He hung out with my sister Carol and myself for over an hour, even though he was on East Coast time and he had a flight the next day. But really good dude, really nice guy. So that'll be coming up in just a second. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to both Japan and South Korea soccer teams. I mean, today's Monday and they were just eliminated in uh, the round of 16 by Brazil and Croatia. Those are just some really good teams they ran up against. So nothing to be ashamed of. Those are some real contenders. But yeah, they provided some real fun. Uh, And, you know, I'm sure they made their countries proud. It's, It's no fun to get eliminated, but, you know... Kudos to them. They did pretty well. Whenever you're top 16 in the world at anything, I mean, that's that's saying something. So I would have liked to have uh, seen them play a couple more games, but oh well. Back to the drawing board. We'll see them again in four years, hopefully. And I want to give a few more shout outs, this time to Margaret and Rebecca. They both sent me an article from the New York Times. The article is called Applying to College and Trying to Appear Less Asian. Yeah, I know. What a what a title, right? And it's about Asian American students, seniors trying to apply to college and realizing that when you're when you're Asian, Asian American, it is not necessarily an advantage. And so they they look this article looks at a couple different students, several different students, and in fact, one of my students is in the article. She's the last student mentioned. Her name is Grace. So shout out to Grace. Good job on being in the article. And hey, come on, Grace. Next time, try to slip in a little a little plug for the Infatuation podcast when you get a chance. But uh, thanks again to Rebecca and Margaret for sending that article. And I hope you guys give that article a read. And if you see Grace out there, say, hey, Grace, good article. Okay, well, that just about does it for our shout outs and updates. And so let's get into our conversation with Chef Ming. Uh, I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. And uh, as usual, thanks for listening. Hey, welcome back to episode number 60 of the Infatuation Podcast. Today we have the immense pleasure of speaking with Chef Ming Tsai. And of course, this collaboration wouldn't be possible if it weren't for my well-connected sister, Carol. So you guys should remember her from past episodes. She's a culinary consultant and a restaurant expert. She's also my executive producer on this episode because uh, whenever I'm stuck for guests, I say, hey, Carol, who do you got for me? And she called up her friend, Ming. And so we're going to talk to him in a second, but let's talk to Carol for a minute. Uh, Hey, Carol, welcome back. Hello, hello. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? I didn't see you for Thanksgiving. I know. I the I got mom and dad into the train so that when I lived in New York, I didn't used to come back for Christmas and Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And now, even though I live in L.A. and technically I could you go could. back for both, <laughs> it's I'm going to see them in a couple weeks. And I was there in October, so yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah well, so I had a friendsgiving. We all cooked a lot of food. You always have yummy food. It looks like. <laughs> yeah, this is this is my trip. You just surround yourself with chefs and. Good cooks. That's the benefit of knowing a lot of chefs. Yeah. Do you uh, do you remember the first time you ever met Chef Ming? I don't know if I remember the exact first time. I'm suspecting it may have been at the Beard Awards. Um, I was living in New York when he was in Boston, of course, and I'm guessing it probably was an something like that, an industry event like that. I am not. I I am not sure. No, it, it definitely was New York, uh, if not the Beard Awards in some event, but it was definitely. It was definitely a food event. Uh, we <laughs> yeah. did not meet that near, at a that burlesque. Was it down. <laughs> we, we weren't we weren't burlesquing or Turkish bathing or anything like that. It there was were, definitely there, a food event. There were chefs involved. Not that we, not that we have not since, of course. <laughs> uh, I, obviously, yeah. But this I, is I not mean, about it could have been us. a Red Sox game. It could have been. That's true. Uh, That's true. A golf yeah, tournament. You, you, how many Red Sox games have you been to, Carol Chin? Not that not as many. Ma- not as many as yeah. you. But I did live in Boston yeah. part time for five years. So, and I, That's I true. most importantly, I was there in two thousand four oh, when they broke good. the curse of the Bambino. 
Yes. And you know, the seventh inning stretch in Fenway, they always sing Sweet Caroline, which I kind of take as like, as, yeah, Carol. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I take credit for that. All right. Well, everyone knows wow. that voice. It's the man himself. It is Chef Ming Tsai, who happens to be, you know, just one of the biggest names in the, the food and television industry. He's been around the restaurant business pretty much your whole life, would you say? Uh, yes, since I was 14. So that would be quite a while. Well, even quite earlier, were you busting tables as a kid or doing homework in the corner? I w- no, I was I was rice maker, janitor, manager at 14 in my mom's restaurant, the Mandarin Kitchen. So, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, got the restaurant bug early, way early. Yeah, yeah. So, but you've owned your own restaurants for over 25 years. And you've earned uh, lots of awards, of course, Chef of the Year, Esquire Magazine, and James Beard Foundation's Best Chef in 2002. And then from there, you went to Food Network, and you started in your own show, East Meets West. And you later started producing and starring in the long-running Simply Ming on PBS. And I, I will say, well, I'll, I'll do a little shout-out to Ming's Quest. I That's one of my favorite shows, to be honest. Wow. That was a great show. <laughs> It was that so that ended abruptly. That ended abruptly on 9-11. Uh, we, were in, we were in Bali shooting. We just finished. I remember it distinctly. It was 9, you know, 9 p.m. our time, 9 a.m. New York time, and the GM, right? There's been a horrible accident in New York. You should uh, – you can't do anything. You're here, but just, you know, there's a horrible accident. Oh, then, of man. course, as you know, then the second tower, then it was like, okay, we're in Indonesia. It's 98% Muslim. I highly suggest we get out of Dodge tomorrow morning. Oh man! First plane, and uh, so yeah, and I mean we luck. I we all we all touched by that, but anyway, let's not go down that rabbit hole. But I did like Quest. Quest was fun. Yeah, Quest was an amazing. That was time. super fun. It was a good show. Yeah, but uh, so we all know you from TV. We all know you. Uh, recently, this summer, uh, you are shifted over from a contestant on Iron Chef to being an Iron Chef yourself on Netflix's reboot of that show. You've authored five cookbooks and won Emmy Awards. And now you've started your own frozen food business as well called Ming's Bings. And the list goes on and on. But it is great excitement to talk to Chef Ming Tsai. Hey, Chef. How's it going? Hey, Curtis. Good to see you. Hello, Carol. Always good to see you. Always good to see you. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Are you still eating leftovers? I just crushed a plate. (laughs) Yes, we had some leftover beautiful ham that had kind of this mango crust on it. And some garlic mashers and a cornbread stuffing and ah. mushroom gravy. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love it. And we had the last bit of the turkey noodle soup, which is by far my favorite thing about Thanksgiving is the soup. Yeah. It's already gone before. Before pies consumed, the soup is already simmering. Is it more of an East soup or a West soup? It's it's like <laughs> a royal. It's like a royal stock, right? I use chicken stock to make the turkey stock. And, you know, East would be, there's a good amount of ginger and then lemongrass uh-huh. in with the mirepoix. And uh, so it's just a very flavorful double stock. And just any diet. But this year I put so many noodles. It's actually my new favorite because it reminds me of Lipton instant soup. Uh-huh. Those noodles. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> right. I finally have made it. I finally have made instant Lipton noodle soup. So my career is complete. You there you go. There you go. <laughs> hey, we always like to talk a little uh, background on our, our guests. And so, if you don't mind, we want to play a little Dayton, Ohio trivia. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. All right. Uh, get me within five miles. What is the driving distance between Dayton and Cincinnati? Oh, you could do it under an hour. So, like, I don't know, 40, 40, 40 miles maybe? Ooh, 53.9. 53.9 oh, on it. Like I said, I could do it under an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess it just depends on how fast you're driving. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I did a little Yelp search on uh, Chinese restaurants in Dayton. How many do you? How many results do you think I came up with when I searched Chinese restaurant in Dayton? Today? I did right it today. Now? Yeah, I did it tonight. Right now, you probably got 15. We're going 90. Wow. Well, it when includes- I was there... When I was there, there was like three. Right. It's so funny. I just met, I just did a, a thing at Cornell and did a couple talks. One of the grandchildren said, hey, do you remember Chop Suey? And I do. Chop uh-huh. Suey carryout next to the Contiki Theater. I used to get Egg Fu Young there, right? I mean, it was <laughs> Chop Suey. Right, Not right. quite Chinese food, but it was more Chinese food than the other restaurants. That and Peking Inn were the two restaurants we would go to. But they also owned... Um, 
Peking Village, which I don't remember. 90? That's crazy. Well, I think they threw in some Japanese hybrids as well. You know, those those pan-Asian yeah. restaurants. That... Always, always avoid people that say they do Thai, Japanese, Chinese well. <laughs> you can't. Impossible. No one does French, Spanish, Mexican well. <laughs> together it's, it's different different anyway well so. if you go back to Dan, you want to go to kung fu noodle four and a half stars kung fu noodle okay right. well thank you and scalini's you know scalini's right i don't i don't scalini's is skyline chili okay oh yeah that's where you, you get go. the three-way the works yeah scalini's right. good date it's very fancy. Is three way out of five way are you a three-way <laughs> it's through no, no no well it's it's only don't some people put the, like all kinds of stuff on it? Yeah, I guess you could. What's the I classic? Just, just, onion, cheese. Uh, chili. Onion, chili, cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks for playing along there. Uh, can we talk a little Mandarin Kitchen? Mandarin Kitchen. There you go. So was, that uh, was one of the three restaurants back so, then. <laughs> yeah. So you were you were just uh, your mom started it and, and ran it. My mom ran the restaurant. My dad helped out. My dad, it still is a rocket scientist. He's a graphite designer. At 93, he works full-time still. He's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, but mom, mom was the chef. Mom's a great cook. She she ran a tight restaurant. The Manor Kitchen was primarily lunch only. It was downtown Dayton in the arcade. So we had to do 100, 120 people in an hour. And so my dad actually invented batch cooking, which is what Chipotle's does now yeah. and all the other fast casuals. Because you couldn't do one dish, one dish, one dish. You couldn't keep up. So we'd have you know a hotel pan of five Mongolian beef, Five sweet and sour pork, five the classic Mandarin food. And we just get yeah, it's rice or noodles, boom, boom, done. And uh I was egg roll cart boy uh, Monday through Friday. I take a cart. Literally, I sold egg rolls and they were a dollar an egg roll, drinks were sixty cents. And uh that's how I first got my um I guess useful personality of being outgoing and uh boisterous and ebullient. Um all of those all of those help when you're selling food or selling anything. Well, I was going to say, that's a lot. Yourself. You send the cute kid out with the cart. Of course, just like, yeah. Who didn't buy an egg roll from you? <laughs> and then uh, okay. <laughs> high, high school and college, you head out east, and you follow your dad a little bit and go in mechanical engineering at Yale. Whose idea was Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Well, who do you think? You <laughs> had to be a doctor, lawyer, engineer. Right. right. I had to be the good Chinese kid. And my brother was an engineer as well. I followed him. So he did Andover Yale. I did Andover Yale. And uh, engineering was, I actually loved science and math, so that made sense for me. Uh, but I equally loved cooking. Hmm. And every summer while, while at Yale, I started going to France. Uh, Alliance Francaise the first summer to learn and master French, because you have to speak French if you cook there. All right. And then eventually apprenticeships. Then junior year, went to Cordon Bleu, the chef school. And that's when I'm like, damn, the French can cook too, especially in pastries and desserts. Yeah, yeah. And that's really the first time I thought, I'm going to do Frenese cuisine. Thank God that name did not stick. That's French Chinese, right? <laughs> I'll call it East West. And, uh, but, but I thought of it. I'm like the two Royal cuisines of the world are French and Chinese. Right. You know, mm. Morimoto san and Nobu san and all my Italian buddies would disagree, but the two classic of all cuisines are French and Chinese. Yeah. And so I wanted to uh, not create my own cuisine, but I wanted to take the highlights of those cuisines and blend. And, uh, so that's, that started it. And, uh, I do remember the conversation after junior year summer. I come back, so I stopped to Court of Blues. I'm like, I want to be a chef. This is what I want to do. And I sat them down. <laughs> they already knew I was interested. They already knew, one, I was pretty good at it, and two, that was my love. So it wasn't a shock when I said, look, guys, I want to move to Paris and cook as soon as I graduate. You know, two weeks I want to be in Paris, and 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 I don't want to be an engineer. Uh, I will finish the major, uh -huh, of course, uh -huh. right? You spent lots of money. Yeah. So I'll get the piece of paper, but I want to go cook. And my mom gave me a huge hug. She's like, you're so lucky at your young age that uh, uh, you already know your passion. Just you know, promise to give 110%. We wholly support you. Keep in mind, that's very cool parents, yeah. right? Because they were both born in Beijing. Uh -huh. And when the Chinese first emigrated here, it was the railroads. We built railroads. Right. When the Bay Road's down, this is the gold rush. And once the gold rush was done, tons and thousands and thousands of Chinese, mostly men only, emigrated to San Francisco to create the first Chinatown because the two metiers the Chinese men could do they couldn't speak English, is cook, do a restaurant, and laundry, and laundry. a laundromat. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. Those are the two fields. And now I do and or yell, and I want to be a cook. So it's a little <laughs> bit of ass backwards, right? Yeah, um, yeah. But my parents are very cool. My mom's like, go give 110%. I look at my dad. Again, he's a rocket scientist. He goes, son, 
you weren't going to be a very good engineer anyway. Go cook. <laughs> I'm like, oh, wow. And, uh, but he's so right. He if you don't see it, love yeah. what you're doing, you can't be yeah. great at anything if you don't love it. Yeah. So I was lucky. That's yeah. interesting. I mean, I, I went through a similar conversation with my parents because I sure. went to well, UC Chinese, Berkeley for history. I was not yeah. going to be a doctor or lawyer, but I, I did go to Cal for history and then just decided I wanted to work in a restaurant after it. <laughs> so yeah. I can relate to that. Now, is your brother still an engineer? Did he pursue engineering? No. He was like half the engineering class. They go to Wall Street. He became yeah. a consultant. Okay. Because yeah. so, right? yeah. <laughs> if you can think analytically, that's that's a skill, which is why I did engineering. Engineering is a great problem solving major, right? Six sure. variables, seven answers. That's the seventh answer. You have to train your mind. Yeah. And, and I do think that actually helps. At the end of the day, having the ability to read spreadsheets and, and, and think, <laughs> yeah. calculate quickly is yeah, very yeah. helpful in the restaurant business. Um, and then funny enough, having done HSN for like six plus years, I was designing my own kitchen equipment. So mm-hmm. PV equals NRT, all the engineering, thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, all applied. And even if it's only 2% application, it sure sounded good. When yeah. the host gets to say, oh, yeah, mechanical engineering major, I cringe every time. They would not not stop saying it because yeah. that was obviously a selling point. And uh, but but uh, but the it. stuff I sold, I loved. They actually worked. Right. I mean, the stuff worked. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. after you finished culinary school, you you cook at a couple different restaurants. Did you cook in San Francisco? Um, I cooked at Silk's, the man in Oriental. You did? Uh, I was sous chef. So my first cooking job after um graduating from Cornell I graduate you know from the hotel school get my master's decide I'm gonna try the hotel business open hotels because opening teams of anything restaurants and hotels is a great way to get experience so open two hotels in Chicago and five restaurants in those hotels in two years time as assistant F&B the worst position possible (laughs) anything that goes wrong in F&B it's your fault right why weren't you there it's like 4 30 a.m because I closed the cafe (laughs) at midnight or whatever and and I missed cooking. So my first chef job, after having cooked professionally, then going to then you know go to Cordon Bleu and then come back, was sous chef at Silks of the Mandarin. I uh, never with, knew that. With the one and only with co sous chefs, we started two weeks apart. Ken Oranger. So no Kenny O and I, the two sous chefs, A and PM, uh, he gets promoted, rightfully so. He he cooked five years more than me by that time at that early on in our career. Uh, he's he's one of the best chefs we have in the country. So he got promoted to chef de cuisine, and I stayed as sous chef, which was actually perfect for me where I was in my career. I got to meet Polly and quality of life. It was fantastic. Um, and then eventually I opened Ginger Club in Palo Alto where oh. my parents could see from their condo. <laughs> um, that was, And that, that didn't even last six months. Uh, from there, I went to Santa Fe, to Santa Cafe, where I actually blessed his soul. Right, Michael Guignor, who's in heaven now, which is just the saddest, saddest. You, do you know Guignor, right, Carol? Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Actually, I, the, the picture I have that I put on Instagram or Facebook was uh, Ken Oranger, me, Todd, and Guignor, and uh, Tetsuya Wakuda in Thailand. Oh, God. Gigi, man. Oh, I can't wow. believe he's dead. Anyway, no. um, yeah. so that's Santa Cafe. Then after that, I got also fired from that job. My wife's like, okay. We need to have you become chef owner so you don't get keep getting fired. <laughs> and both the fires are bullshit. These guys are, are idiots, to be honest. And you can ask my wife one day. Anyway, <laughs> so we ended up in Boston. Ken Oranger and Tide Angus were both in Boston. Kenny's like, you'll kill it. Your food will kill it here. And I ended up going to Wellesley, where there's a great space that my ex-sister-in-law found. is an old grocery store. And I'm like, this is great. Look at the demos. Todd sells pizza on an upside down sheet tray. He's killing it. <laughs> and uh, he's like, Yo, you'll crush it here. And yeah, and the rest, you know, the rest was history. We we opened and and just I, I can proudly say we you know, we got our accolades and I got my chef accolades, all that before Food Network. Yeah, before it wasn't a PR thing. It was just solid food and solid service. And so, you know, we got our three stars. We got the chef of the year, all that. Then Food Network hit, which was just right place, right time. I did the right yeah. style of food. Uh, and then that was, then that just took it to the next level, which was, yeah. you know, I was lucky. I dissuaded my kids from being chefs. They both know how to cook. They're both pretty good. I'm like, you don't want to be a chef. Uh, because yeah. I'm not, I'm like, I was lucky. I hit it the right place, right time. Yeah. And Food Network was just growing. And, right. and everyone's a chef now. You have people that have <laughs> 5 million views and it's a cook, yeah. you know, kid in Northern Colorado. That, you know, but he's hip. And so anyway, yeah, um, 
And it's hard. And with COVID and with staffing, you know, 25% of our labor force, I think, is gone permanently, right? People have left yeah. the industry. They realize this is not for me. There's other things out there I can do. And, and uh, uh, you know, almost every other restaurant's a fast casual now. Yeah. <laughs> there's that, yeah. yeah. There's super, there's still French laundries and stuff. There's still super high end and there's still fast food. But the, the, the restaurants middle, we love to yeah. go to normally, they're the ones that are suffering the most because you still need, great service and you need great mm-hmm. cooks and it's slowly coming back, but it's, it's been a struggle. It's been slow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, the yeah. food costs and inflation right now. Is oh, just food bananas. costs. Yeah. And then you got to pay 15, 20 an hour right. and the margins are just brutal and you can't charge $80 a steak. And people yeah. won't have it. Yeah. Well, when you started, do you know, like besides Martin Yan, were you, were you the first Asian American, like born in America chef on TV? Do you know? Well, Martin wasn't born here, right? Right. So, so Martin where are you born first in Hong then? Kong? <sighs> yeah, that I know of. I feel like it. I don't know. <laughs> you know I mean, there's because like Joyce Chen, right? And, right. and you know, but she wasn't born here either. I don't believe. It. I think she was born in China. Uh, I'm in positive she was born in China. So, and if she here, was probably. on TV, it wasn't to the level that you were on. Yeah. I mean, right? It was PBS. Maybe a guest was segment. Just, or I mean, something. there was no food network. There was not a national mm-hmm. network. Even PBS, it's. It's national if you're in, in all stations, but you right. start, you know, you start GBH or KUD, whatever you start. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, I was very lucky. And I and I know how blessed and fortunate I was to be in that position uh, and very proud of the fact that, I'm, you know, I, I got to represent, that I got yeah. to, you know, represent the Asian community. You know, I, I my English is pretty good, right? I didn't, <laughs> there's no, I didn't have to, you know, and Martin's a great old, old buddy and he, yeah. yeah, he plays his Asian accent up he's a little legend. bit. Yeah, no, he knows he's legend. that. Yeah, he's legendary for that. But that's okay. That worked. That worked for him. I was preparing for this. I was reading the book from scratch about the Food Network launch, and it does mention that they, the executives, kind of thought it was great that you were native English speaker because, at the time, comparing you to like Wolfgang Puck or Jacques Pepin, there were a lot of of famous chefs who who didn't speak English as their native language. Um, forget Asian, just, you know, a lot of these right. European chefs. So, right. so their heavily accented English was actually, you know, difficult for viewers. Yeah. So I think they, <laughs> they were very well, grateful. I think that's, that's, that's prevented, honestly, Eric Repair and Jose Andres from having mm-hmm. a, a, a great show here because yeah. it, yeah. it is hard to understand. Right. And yeah. there's no fault of theirs. It's just, no. that's I mean, not they still put language. subtitles for Ludo. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he gets annoyed. Yeah, I He's like, I speak English. Yeah. 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 They would definitely need subtitles for my Chinese if I did a show in Chinese, <laughs> but you check it. I could muster, but they would need subtitles just in case. And uh, so, anyway, yeah. So, obviously, uh, for me to be uh, in that position, I'm very proud of. It, right. It's, it's, uh, um, and, and, it, and, it, and it goes without saying there's a responsibility with that as well, right? I mean, basically, I've been told by not only just Paris, there's some really tight confidants, like, basically, don't F up, <laughs> right? It's, it's, uh, all, it's all you. <laughs> you there, there aren't that many role models. My parents had me down once because literally my brother and all my cousins have all been divorced. And they're like, you're the last one standing. <laughs> don't, don't F up. I'm like, okay, no pressure. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so knock on wood uh, i think my, my wife would kill me so i would not just be divorced i'd be dead so <laughs> there you go so then yeah you move over to pbs um and you start doing simply ming did you did you think in your head oh i could probably do this for two decades was that was that in the back of your mind when you started that uh, um no because that would be way overconfident i knew that i knew i had a product that that had legs right because all of us chefs, not just me, all of us chefs are content creators. So yeah. to, to do a new recipe, to do a new theme, to do that, that's what we do every day. So that's, it's actually quite easy for us chefs to continue doing a cooking show. And, um, and, and I developed this whole riff that I let, I let my guest chef cook first. And now I do riff off their dish, you know, yeah, yeah. as a lady has been doing a healthier vegetarian version of their dish quite often and mm-hmm. stuff like that, which, you know, I'm eating more plant-based and, and, and whatnot. Um, but I still get to teach, which is really, I think one of my goals, you're, you're, you're a teacher, right, there, right. Curtis. I mean, <laughs> there, there's that inherent joy of helping people to learn something. And, and, you know, the ultimate is serving food in a restaurant because you actually get to see their reaction and you can make them happy. When you teach someone something, you're making them happy, but indirectly, <laughs> they may not know for five years for and years, they apply yeah, what yeah. you just taught them, right? They may yeah. never know. Hey, so they may never give you any credit nor me for that matter, but 
Um, but there's that inherent joy of teaching, right? And I still, yeah. I still do enjoy that. Yeah, when you first started, it was kind of like, okay, let me teach you about all the kinds of Asian noodles in one episode. <laughs> yep, yeah. No, I mean, look, it's, it's a, you bring up an interesting point. When I first at East meets West, and we're talking 98, right? Right, right. I was very basic. I had to introduce yeah. the viewers to the, the here's different soy sauces. They're not all the same. They're not all created equal. And here are all the noodles. And here are all the different mm-hmm. wrappers. And, and, um, uh, and I didn't dumb it down. I just think a majority of the people watching did not know. Yeah. Um. And yeah. and and just you know, again, for for all the responses you get via email back then, there wasn't social social yet. Uh. But all the questions and responses, people loved that it was brought down to the basics, so they now know what they do. Because a lot of them had all those condiments in their in their fridge and their pantries, they never knew what to do with them. Yeah. So I think I think if anything, I don't know the number or the percentage. But people started cooking more with Asian ingredients and techniques yeah. uh, because it was not harder. It was just different. So if explained clearly, people said, ah, well, it's not as hard as I thought because it's not as hard. It's not. It was no harder than any food, right? Yeah, yeah. Cooking a hamburger is actually takes real technique. A good burger takes technique. You can't, you can't just slap it around, right? Same as a, a good beef and broccoli. It's just technique. It's not hard to do. Yeah. So you got uh, 18 seasons of memories. What, do you have any highlights out of those seasons? It's a lot. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, I, the, the most honored guests always are my parents. Uh-huh. So when uh-huh. I have my parents on, it's by far the most popular show. And people love more than anything seeing my mom boss me around <laughs> and, saying, <laughs> and saying how ugly my dumplings look. Or not yeah. quite ugly, yeah, yeah. just how much better is her right. look than mine. And she's speaking the truth. <laughs> she wasn't lying. I mean, theirs did look better than mine, right? Uh, so I, so those are by far my favorite because obviously my parents. And, and look, every chef friend is on there. I, 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 do, I do have to single, you know, single out Jacques. Because Jacques is Jacques, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and and I never got to have Julia on. She passed before I had that opportunity. Uh, but there's there's just, there really is only one Jacques Pepin, right? Yeah. I mean, I have amazing chef friends. Carol, you know them all. Your friends as well, so all of them. Uh, Jacques just, he just stands apart. Because he's a, yeah. he's an ambassador now. He's a statesman. He, I mean, he's, he, yeah. li- he literally, if you need a definition of living legend, Mm-hmm. It's Jacques Pepin yeah, right now. Yeah, I mean, and he keeps giving. He's going to do his foundation to his last day, hundred uh-huh. percent. And he just, uh, he's still. If you go to, I've fortunately been over his place in Connecticut to play petanque, great. Right? And <laughs> he's in the kitchen still cooking. Yeah, he's he's just like I'm going to be when I'm in my nineties. I hope just still and and like pushing people out of the way to get out At of the high way. level. I, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sear the duck whole feet. Right, it's just absurd. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and uh, and you got and literally, look, I'm pretty good at certain things. He's like a magnificent at everything. His mm-hmm. artwork, his menus, his calligraphy, his cooking. I yeah, mean, he's it's, a it's painter, absurd. Curtis. I don't know. Yeah, yeah his paintings of his organization of his pots and pans at his home. I mean, <laughs> he just you know, we would if you could be 15 percent of Jacques Pepin, you're doing well. <laughs> you're doing okay. Right? He's a yeah, literally yeah. living legend. Wow! 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 I agree. Uh, and you've done the show long enough. You've got uh, Henry uh, assisting you on some episodes now. Yes. So that was a uh, uh, look. You either froze or rose during COVID, right? Right. So we decided. Well, I'm not going to freeze. Let's continue simply making. And look, it was technology. Literally, it's two iPhones in the house. <laughs> Facebook Live, and then translate, edit it, and throw it on PBS. And and look, and Henry really enjoyed doing it. He's yeah. actually pretty good at it. He 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 tries to boss me around too he doesn't quite get away with it like mom because he's my son right. he tries and people yeah. people caught that it's cute yeah. uh but yeah but he's a joy i mean he, he's got he's got a good talent and uh so part of us which i'm taking this year off right now simply ming uh solely because of ming's bangs i'm just yeah thank god we'll talk about it a little bit four times so busy with it and you know there there are new incredibly interesting platforms in video streaming yeah. right i mean we're we're doing a podcast right now right right and but there's this new the you probably heard of it kitsch kitsch is this new yeah. platform and and, Chef Gordon. and yeah yeah chef's friend brian is doing it and i've had many conversations with brian i think he's got bianco 
Right, he does. I think he's gonna use, he's gonna be on pizza. He did a meat, Dina, Dina pizza, some meatball or Dina something. pizza, and veggies. Pa- Dina pasta. I'm gonna be Dina of Asian cuisine. <laughs> yeah, um, nice. but I think I think I actually think there's something there because I actually think that's not just that's not just for entertainment, which most cooking shows are, and you get to learn something. You, it's entertainment, but you get to learn something. This is actually, the, at least the way I've been described it, and the way I think it's gonna play out, and in, in the one I'm responsible for, is learn the basics. Yeah. Learn the basics and actually get a certification. It's not going to, the certificate is not going to get you into the next school or anything, but at least says you saw something you know, yeah. 20 hours or 40 hours, or you learned the basic 15 Asian techniques or the basic 15 ways to make pasta or pizza. Right. And, and it can be more interactive. So I think people will correct. kind of take to that. Yeah. It's live. It's, it's meant to be done live. You can see it on tape, of course, later. But the initial class is exactly that, Carol. Live, so people can ask you the questions. Like, can you do that fold again? Or how do you know the hot dough is ready? I mean, cool things like that that doesn't exist right now. And then, of course, there's the whole revenue stream of, can I get that board, that knife, your chef coat, your mm-hmm, first son, mm-hmm. whatever, right? <laughs> I mean, you can you, you touch it, you can buy it, basically. I Actually, and, this is uh, a good – I got to give you a shout-out because I remember – the I forget the title of the book. The one you did with the QR codes – Yep. So uh, you did a book where for every recipe, there was a QR code that you could scan and take you directly to a video of you cooking that recipe. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't know yeah, if another cookbook. Thank you. And I don't know if another yeah, book it, that's done and, that. And remarkably, it didn't take off like I thought it would. I mean, I sold, you were the, too same, early. I sold the same amount of books. I was a little too early. I sold the same amount of books as all the other books. And it cost significantly more because I did uh-huh. all the videos. Um, but that idea and not even having to print it is yeah. really really compelling because yeah. all you need is a I laptop mean, or an iPhone and you can, you know, and eventually, and, and their idea is good. Of course, eventually you have a thousand videos. You can search pasta primavera. Mm-hmm. You're going to have a veggie recipe. There's the video. Here's the pasta. And you want to do, you know, hopefully it'll be, I want an Asian version of that. Then maybe, Oh, it's fermented black beans. Right. It's just, it'll be all interactive and all interlinked. Yeah. That, that sounds cool. But yeah, maybe it's just too early. huh? I mean, that was Possible. 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, ten plus. I I've mean, been now, lazy. now people. I, I haven't done a book in like five years. I just been. <laughs> I don't think just, you're lazy. Bar- no, I'm not lazy. It just it hasn't but, been a priority. But I mean, it now be. everyone's trained to use their phone to scan a QR code to get the menu at a restaurant because of COVID. Yeah. It's like that's just second yeah. nature. Even my mom could, pro- you know. But yeah. ten years ago, it was kind of yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Edge. Oh yeah, totally. Well, you had to have you have to have an app, right? Now you just right. have to have a phone. That's your photo. Yeah. All right, so uh, most recently you've been doing a little iron chefing. How, what was that like for you? I heard you say that's one of the more stressful things you've done. Oh, it's yeah, it's absolutely high stress, high pressure. Um, by far the most fun okay. and challenging thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, it's it's legit hard, right? I mean, the yeah. sixty minutes or the seventy five minutes, it's true to the second. You don't get an extra second. Yeah, and five and, dishes. Yeah, it's five dishes. You have to make, and you have to make mise en place or times five. So you need twenty five mise, you know, mise en place. Um, it's a, it's a lot of training. It's working with your team, right? But if you screw up, yeah. If you do, uh, if you do a critical screw up, you're out. Like you yeah. show with four dishes, you're yeah. done. Um, and like battle sturgeon, there's a couple things. Like I, I remember CC, she had to re- redo the noodles. Or she had to redo her fish. She smoked it too hard. It was a little bit dry. And I think Cheno overcooked his noodles. And those you could maybe, but if you did it a second time, you're done too. Yeah. Because yeah. everything is critical path. Everything is builds on everything else. And, uh, but I'm so competitive, right? I, I raised my <laughs> kids when they were young, when they were two and four years old, up the staircase, I would hit them, push them to make sure I still won. <laughs> Right, and my mom and my wife's like, let them win. I'm like, never, never. There's no participation <laughs> awards in my house. They will win one day easily, and they will never let me win again. That, that of course, has already happened. Grasshopper, and, uh, when you can snatch uh, the pebble I, yeah. from my hand. Yeah, exactly. So, so I loved it. So I'm built. I'm built to be an iron child. I just love competition. I love, you know, I'm very proud of my cooking skills, and 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 I have good speed with that. Uh, but most importantly. Because I eat so much food, I have a decent palate. Yeah, yeah, which is important. Do you do you have a theory of why there aren't more Asian American chefs on TV, the mainstream ones? Because huh. people love cooking um, it, people love eating it. I mean, there, there's the next generation, right? Jet Tillo's coming up. Yeah, um, Molly. But I can't Ed. name you five of them. Yeah, 
Right. Yeah, Molly. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, the challenger on Iron Chef. Right. Esther right. Yeah. Choi. Esther Choi. Esther. Esther's coming up. Yeah. So I you mean, know, Shirley Choi. is on going to be on Tournament of Champions again, and sure. yeah, so um, sure. Sheldon. So I think... Sheldon in Hawaii, but almost in Hawaii, yeah, like kills you're it. not. <laughs> everyone's Asian in Hawaii, so I feel <laughs> yeah. like it's a little no, less. Uh, yeah. Look, it start. It started historically, right? Chinese Asians are bashful. There's it's quiet. They don't want to be in front of the camera. So that's historically. And then there's my generation or Martin and Martin like broke the ice, so to speak. Um, but I just don't think there was there. There certainly weren't. I have not seen anyone crazy, quote unquote, like Guy Fieri, who came out with Spike right. Terra that on YouTube and stuff right now on social media. There's a some crazy agents doing all, all sorts of stuff. That's um, for sure. TikTok. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. TikTok millennials. They're, they're half of them are Asian. Right. So, right. so, I, so I guess it's coming. Um, yeah. And, uh, but that's a whole other discussion because there are professionally trained chef TV shows and then there's the rest. And I'm not saying one's better or not because some of those things I watched a TikTok. I'm on TikTok. I, uh-huh. I, I didn't poo-poo it. I just didn't understand it. I'm like, right, really? Right. Who, what? 60 seconds? What are you talking about? I mean, I hate to and say it. It's I not did, our and, generation. <laughs> yeah, no. But but once I hired someone from Ming's Bings, who was 21, and she's like, Chef, you got to go on TikTok. All you do is create, you just create content. You would be, you people, you'd crush it. And she was right. Yeah. She was absolutely yeah. right. People just want to learn a hack. They want to know what they can do with an instant ramen. How can they make it better? They want to know how to make uh, two ingredient fried rice. They want it right. People yeah. want the quick hacks. Yeah. And uh, and I again it still it fell within what I like to do, which is teach. Yeah. And I can yeah. teach with three ingredients or I can teach how you make, you know, foie gras shu mai. So Yeah, I, I saw you on a little collab with uh, Lisa Nguyen. And yeah, she's Lisa's got like four million followers on, on yeah. YouTube and you know, no training whatsoever. And she just, you know, but she's killing it. Like she's can you imagine she's getting four million <laughs> views when you're in twenty years old? Oh my god. I mean, honestly, we we just connected through DM. She like liked something I did. I'm like, dude, let's do something together. That's how that started. Yeah, yeah. And like, oh, I'm gonna be in the Boston area doing this summer. I'm like, let's cook. Yeah, it's that simple. And uh, yeah, I mean, and to me, it's not. I'm not stepping down cooking with Lisa. Lisa cooks yeah. the way she cooks, and she has her following, and I cook the way I cook. And I'm not better or worse than her. We're just different, but we're both are teaching. Our audiences, something. Yeah, it, so was, it was cool for me. For me, it works. Oh, I love doing it. I love to do more with her. And there's there's dozens and dozens, dozens. of leases out there that yeah. are killing it. And grandmas killing and aunties too. <laughs> you know, like Munchie. oh my god, you yeah. see the old and what's his name? There's some old Italian guy. He's like 85. Yeah, like Luigi or something. He's cooking. Yeah, you got the Nonias and the it's the pasta grannies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pasta grannies. You know what? I think it's it's. It's a very harmless form of entertainment, so I think that's good. Yeah, right. We don't. I don't think we have enough harmless entertainment. Not, enough of America doesn't watch PBS. One of my rules growing up as a kid in Dayton, Ohio, is we got a half an hour situation comedy a night. That was our max. Uh-huh. Right. We could watch all the PBS we wanted. We could watch all the sports, live sports, and all the news we wanted. So those are free. Half hour of situation comedy. That's so we're talking about Brady Bunch and Gilligan's rough, Island, man. right? <laughs> So, however, my dad was in the Air Force, civilian in the Air Force. My brother and I convinced him that Hogan's Heroes was historically significant. So that should count towards History Channel. And he watched it with us once. He's like, okay. There were POWs in World War II, so we'll let it go. (laughs) So we got Hogan's in. That was good. Hey, on, a, on a more serious note, we, we do have something in common. Um, a couple years ago, my, my wife was diagnosed with cancer, and fortunately, Dark. she is a survivor, uh, like your wife as well. And, and that kind of nice. prompted some changes in in your diet. But did Ming's Bings come out of that, or was it kind of just a yep. happy coincidence? Oh, okay. Oh, no, 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 no. The whole creation of the company was was my wife's diagnosis. We um, I, I used to serve Ming's Bings at Blue Ginger. Right. Okay. And those were literally bing. A bing is a traditional dim sum item. But I did the round round bings like this called share bings. So in Taiwan and Beijing, they have these filled with pork, juicy, yeah. uh, pot sticker dough, Amazing. hot water dough. Yeah. Delicious. Um, and 
when my wife got her diagnosis, we made a decision she should go vegan. Uh, just all our research and uh, reduce reduce inflammation, reduce sugar. And so vegan is a great way to reduce inflammation because all proteins have inflammation. Plants do not. Uh, gluten has inflammation, mm-hmm. of course. Sugar, cancer feeds on sugar. And so actually I was uh, going to the grocery store seeing – what could she eat? This is pre-COVID. I was traveling a bunch. What could I buy for her that she could eat while I'm not around to cook for her? There's nothing in the plant-based, right? And yeah. veggie patties, there's boca, garden, uh, with Dr. Prager's, they're all dry hockey pucks, emulsified yeah. chickpeas and edamames, yeah. horribly dry, horrible to eat. And I'm like, okay, this is my mission. I'm going to redefine the veggie, pack- the veggie patty market. And I'm going to flip the paradigm, put the emulsification on the outside. I developed the brown rice wrapper, uh, sh- I chefed it out, got the best <laughs> tasting of the plant-based proteins before the butcher. One, uh, GMO-free soybean, so the shortest list as well, so not as processed as the other ones, but the flavor was the best. And then I would add stuff like natural smoke and caramelized onions and garlic, ginger, and spices to make it taste good, Yeah, yeah. And uh, which is not a different form than any other chef, but it's just put into a frozen thing that was pre-dipped in oil, so super easy to cook. It's 60 minutes in an air fryer. And, um, and you know, knock on wood, I got the right partners. And and obviously, the plant-based trend is is not just a trend. It's here to stay, but it's very strong right now. You know, we got kind of got to ride the tailways of both Beyond and Impossible. Beyond is in its own little spin right now, as you know. Impossible is doing fantastic. But people are realizing, okay, there's plant-based product out there. The problem with Impossible and Beyond and whatnot is you still have to cook it to taste good. Yeah. Right? You, you have raw product, you still got to do something yeah. with it. Ming's Bings are a pop final in, product, yeah. <laughs> and you pop them in your fryer, pop them in your oven, and uh, and it's been thank God for food service, also a, a big avenue between prep schools and and stadiums and colleges, uh, which is a great market for us because especially our breakfast Bings, which we just launched, um, everyone's looking for a grab and go, a good a good handheld pocket. What's and, the uh, breakfast so, thing about? I need to try one of those. Uh, breakfast, I launched at the Food and Wine in New York just two mm-hmm. months ago. It's a uh, just egg made from mung bean, so delicious, zero cholesterol, with biolife cheese and potato, and there's the sausage as well. Um, we have four different breakfasts. We have a veggie breakfast, uh, just an egg and cheese as well. They're awesome. They'll, they'll probably be in at least half the stores. We're in almost 4,000 stores right now. Mm. I think half of those lines are going to start carrying it. We're talking to some of the big boys right now. So it's exciting. Yeah. And, uh, but, but let me, let me tell you this, Chris, our, no. our motto, if I may, our motto is eat good, feel good, do good, right? Eat good. Cause it has to be delicious. I'm an iron chef, right? So it doesn't <laughs> taste good. Start over. <laughs> feel good. Cause plant-based does make you feel better. Uh, and also if you believe in science, as we all do, it should make your mind feel a little better because it's a little bit better for the environment. Actually, a lot better for the environment. So much less water, less methane gas, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then do good. Because some proceeds of all sale of Ming's Bings benefit two charities close to my heart, Dana Farber, the first charity that saved my wife's life, saved my CEO's life, uh, and Family Reach. Family Reach, yeah. we financially help families dealing with cancer. Uh, I'm proudly, I'm the president of their national advisory board. I've raised over 10 million bucks for them over the last 11 years. So it's something that's very close to me. Yeah. I mean, so that's what Ming's Bings is about. I think, I think any successful company, true successful companies, have to have a purpose. And have to leave their mark. Not just look. If you make everyone money, that's fantastic. But who did you help along the way? Yeah, yeah. Triple uh, bottom line. Very cool. Very cool. I saw you in a little Ming Bing mobile ha- helping out some families during the holidays. That was very awesome. Yep. Yep. Uh, so we we can get Ming's Bings pretty much anywhere nowadays. So yeah, East Coast were Wegmans and Roast Brothers and Days Market, Market Basket. Down south we're in Publix. Uh, out west we're in Sprouts. Um, and we're in Hawaii actually, which is one of our great markets through targets. So we're like 350 targets. Uh, we're growing in whole foods. Hopefully we're only in 30 whole foods right now. So our plan, we're in 4,000 basically stores now. Hopefully we'll be in about 6,000 plus by, by end of the year. We're the official big of the Boston Red Sox. So we'll be back <laughs> at Fenway. We're at the garden as well for Celtics and Bruins games. Uh, so we start over at Barclays as well. We're starting there. Joe Sy's place and. Dolphins had them this year, and the Rays had them. So we're uh, slowly infiltrating. If yeah. it could, uh, if it could spread as fast as COVID, I'd be a billionaire. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. 
And of course, you can find them over at Ming.com and you can find out more information and the story behind it. Yeah, Ming's there. Bings. Ming's Bings.com. Oh, Ming's Bings.com. Yeah, Bings. yeah, so the best thing to do is if you want to know if you can get them close to you is go to Ming's Bings.com. Go to the Bing Finder and it'll give you the closest store that carries them. Um, and we do, of course, do uh, for the holidays, you can buy gift gift uh, packages and we mail them all over the country. All right. Curtis, you're getting so, some Bings for I'm, Christmas. I'm looking forward to some Bings. Yeah, that would be great. There you go. All right, let's end this. Ep- well, we're going to end this episode with a lightning round. I don't know how funny these questions are, but we'll give it a try. All right. <laughs> okay. Any, uh, any, you know. any cooking disasters on live TV or any kind of a live demonstration that you can remember? Oh, my God. Just recently, I was at the South Beach Food and Wine and I was shaking a watercress like gin cocktail. And, you know, I do this a thousand <laughs> times and you, you just get it in a cup. I hit it and the glass shatters. <laughs> and, and my glass goes everywhere, like all over my watercress. My my chicken that's cooking is <laughs> everywhere. And you can't do anything. You just keep yep. going, right? Like, audience, I need a new yeah. shaker, please. And yeah. And so that was kind of. And, and, and nobody ate this, this, this chicken. Yeah, that no, I'm no, no one's eating it. I, I still I carefully ate it just to make sure I didn't kill myself. So yeah, <laughs> that, that was pretty embarrassing. And, and look, and it happens, on yeah. live TV, like a GMA and stuff, I mean, you, you, you just have to have backup. Because yeah. you're going to burn something. You always do. You so always. you always have the final fine. I'm like, you know, you should see the final dish. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah that, that yeah. happens all the time. All, all right. right. Sorry. It's not, I'm not very good at lightning rounds. I speak too much, but no, keep going. No, you're, no, we're fine. Uh, are there two chefs that you'd like to see battle it out in some kind of a cont- contest where you're the tasting judge? Which two chefs would you like to see? That's a great one. Um, Grand Akez versus Jose Andres uh, would ooh. be a great one. Morimoto san versus Nobu would be a great one too. And what are your secret ingredients for them? What what ingredient would you throw at them? Uh for the first two, I would throw something like those two. It'd be something as simple as like extra virgin olive oil. Okay, yeah, because you just or, want to eat something right? good. Yeah. So, something right, and and I think for the two Japanese, I would I'd be something like fresh wasabi root, yeah, right? or a yeah. white soy or something. Yeah, right. Because I would, I would want that. I mean, if this is a free meal. I want them to cook. Stand back yeah. and let the master and, and cook. And I don't want to do the. I don't want to do the obvious truffle, white truffle, right, which right. would be smart to do. But then, I mean, <laughs> nothing's wrong with twelve dishes of truffles. Battle by the way. truffle, come on, yeah. <laughs> battle yeah. truffle, yeah. Yeah, maybe battle white truffle. We have to do. We have to do this. Yeah, never mind. Battle white truffle <laughs> for both. For, for all, of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For all of them. <laughs> Get a couple kilos right. of white truffles. All right, we know we know Jacques Pepin has a, a soft spot for Oreo cookies. What is Ming Tsai's kind of guilty pleasure off the g- uh, gas station snack rack? What do you grab when no one's oh, looking? Wow. Um, I I love my ranch pump, my ranch seeds, right? The sunflower seeds in the shell. In the shell. I like taking a handful. Spit them out the, the window. Yeah. I have my cup. <laughs> yeah, and I, at least I do it in the cup. Okay. My wife hates it. She's, I mean, I don't chew tobacco, but she likens it to me chewing tobacco. And she's like, that's disgusting. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so is chicken feet, which I just had today doing some, but I mean, what else you supposed to do with the bones? I ate 800 bones in one foot. So, of course, there's going to be bones. So, anyway, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, that's not even that guilty. It's, it's not. No. It's, a, it's a seed. It's good for you. It's good yeah. for you. The MSG. Little, right. I was going to say a little MSG. Record, yeah, but MSG is, MSG is no worse for you it's than salt. It's got a bad rap, Period. yeah. yeah. Period. Yeah. It's actually better for you because you can use less MSGs than the right. equivalent of salt to make something savory. Yeah. So yeah. it's got such a bad rap, <laughs> right? I don't have salt shakers, though, like Chang does. <laughs> um, I haven't gone that far, but... A little sprinkle never I'm hurts. not against yeah. it. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. Nice. All right. We end each episode by asking our guests to name an infatuation. Infatuation is anyone in the Asian community that has inspired you or that you look up to. But Chef Ming Zai, who is your infatuation? Oh, <laughs> so, I tell you, the one I've never met is Jackie Chan. Okay. That guy has more talent than anyone. Yeah. The guy does all his own stunts. Uh, and f- for the friends that have met him, Apparently, just a genuinely nice, funny, humble person. Yeah. Um, and for some, I'm trying to think of someone that I have met and hung out with that, you know, um, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I would say someone that I had the ultimate respect for, and I got to meet him one time, 
And he spoke to me through a translator five minutes on Nori. And I never honestly thought about Nori besides as a seaweed wrapper, but how Nori was, what kind of Nori, how toasted, how yaki, how Nori, you know, how toasted it was, how much salt was put on it, all mattered. Uh, and and he had a busy little restaurant. He didn't need to spend five minutes with me, but he did. He knew I was a chef from the States. Uh, this is Jiro-san. So I got to go hang out. Just literally, I mean, he has what, like 14 seats in his restaurant? Yeah. Jiro drinks right? of sushi Literally. in yeah. Tokyo. And um, it was, yeah, that was a dream. Not as as any person, but right. sp- certainly as a chef. Right. To, to see someone at the top of his craft, top of his game. And and there's no hype, right? It yeah. wasn't, you know, and he, he, he easily met the expectations I had. Which are really high expectations when yeah. someone says it's the best nigiri you ever had in your life, um, <laughs> and, and he did not disappoint. But again, so humble and yeah. just you know an inspiration for me. Uh, the, the last two people I mentioned there, and like my dad, they are so humble, and mm-hmm. that's something that that I need to um, resemble more of. Yeah, yeah, no, very cool. Well, Chef, you're today you're our infatuation, so thanks so much for coming on with us. <laughs> and you're doing so much good in the Appreciate world, it. as well as just bringing smiles to people's faces. So thanks for spending some time with us. Yeah, Curtis, great to see you, Carol. Always a pleasure. Let us we'll know next time, next time you're out here in L.A., I, I dim, dim sum in uh, the SGB. Oh, that would be good. Let's do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Got to. Got to. All awesome. right, Chef. All right. Thanks so All much. Right, Chef. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for doing this. Take care. You're welcome. Ciao. Bye. Bye. <laughs> all, right. all right what a nice guy yeah see like not much more talks and sound bites stays yeah, on the track <laughs> no, he, he knows how to do it yeah he's a professional yeah he's he's a talker oh my god shirley and kim lie are just so funny <laughs> no i would no but i'll have shirley back on in a second you know if she ever wants no, to she's in. hysterical and like just very entertaining it's just very yeah, hard to steer no a conversation filter, yeah. in any certain way <laughs> yeah 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 no. Like you do this whole show show run and you really for her just need two questions and it's an yeah. hour. It's a 90 minutes exactly. conversation. No, it was. It was literally like a two hour conversation yeah. for like three questions. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right. <laughs> cool. All right. So I will catch you soon. Okay, cool. See ya. See ya. Bye.